Okay, welcome to another Orbiter 2010 video. And this is another video in my series that I'm putting together that I'm basically calling the Absolute Beginner Guide. And this video series has an emphasis on people that are brand new to Orbiter. Uh, you've downloaded the program, you've got it installed, but you're still struggling to just do uh, very basic tasks with Orbiter. So I am assuming that you are watching these videos in order. Uh, I believe we're up to number five or six now. I've actually kind of started to lose count myself. But I'm assuming that uh, you've watched you know, part one and that you know how to get your vessel into uh, a stable orbit. And in part three and four, we kind of talked about how to align planes. So, you know, these videos were, were they're stepping stones. Each one is each one is building on concepts that we covered in previous videos. So if you're finding this video um, as your first one, then you're gonna, gonna you're going to want to go back and start at part one and watch them in order. Okay, in the last video we covered how to uh, raise our orbit and how to lower our or how to lower our orbit. And that's a important concept that uh, we absolutely have to understand if we're ever going to get much of it anywhere in space. And we also talked about sort of the dangers of orbital decay. You know, what, what can happen if you're not paying attention and you accidentally lower your orbit on one side a bit too far. You get down into, uh, you know, once you get down much below 150 kilometers, you start experiencing a lot of orbital decay and so we just want to make sure that we're constantly aware of our situation so that we don't have any of those types of problems. Now finally uh, we are getting probably to what is going to be the exciting part for a lot of new orbinauts. We're going to talk about the actual rendezvous process. This is where we will catch up to the International Space Station. Now, I'm not actually going to cover docking in this video. Docking is actually pretty simple, uh, but we'll save that for a separate video. The rendezvous process is probably going to be the more difficult step th that you'll encounter. When you're, when you're starting out, you're going to find that getting up into orbit and getting a stable, you know, 200 kilometer orbit, that meaning that you're apoapsis and your periapsis are both about 200 kilometers, that's a stable low earth orbit, you'll find that you'll be able to do that pretty easily. And I think you'll also find that aligning the plane is a pretty simple process once you understand, you know, the descending node and the ascending node. But the actual rendezvous process is a little tricky and it requires uh, us to look at another MFD which is called sync orbit MFD. But I'll do my best to go through this slowly so that you can follow along and I'm also going to do at least two different rendezvous maybe even three or four because this is this this rendezvous process is tricky enough that I don't feel like just showing one example is good enough I think you need to see it at least two or three times but let's go ahead and jump into it now as we discussed, we've already aligned the plane, so we're basically we're basically done with aligned plane MFD. As we go around the Earth, we can experience something called permutations in our orbit, and sometimes those permutations can knock our relative inclination out just a little bit. You know, for it may go from 0 0.00 to say 0 0.01 or something like that. So every now and then, as we're circling the globe, we may want to bring back up a line plane MFD just to make sure that our orbit hasn't been perturbed by some amount. And on the topic of permutations, I want to mention that in the orbiter launch pad, when you go into the parameters, there are some different options for realism. One of the options that I highly recommend that you turn off when you're new is the non-spherical gravity sources. I think it's okay to leave the uh, gr uh, gradient torque, I think that's what it's called. I think it's okay to leave that one turned on, but the non-spherical gravity sources will, it's, it's a very advanced, well, I shouldn't say very advanced, but it's an advanced concept. And when you're new to Orbiter, you, you don't really want to have that turned on. It will make things way confusing for you. 
and you really you know think of it in terms of uh, if you're wanting to learn to drive a car you don't want to start out by getting on the Indy 500 raceway with a bunch of other drivers you want to start off in your mom and dad's you know four-cylinder uh, car and drive around the neighborhood you know you want to start simple so turn off the non-spherical gravity sources if you have that enabled okay now let's bring up orbit MFD on this side and as usual we'll do what we usually do which is to change the projection to ship and we'll change the distance readout so that we have our distance showing above the surface as we go forward in these vi in the future videos I'm going to do this kind of thing automatically and I'm not going to explain it every single time because by now hopefully you've, you know you've seen the previous videos and you know why I'm making these changes what I'm also going to do is target the ISS and we we already know from previous videos how to do that so I'm just gonna go ahead and do that so what we have here showing in orbit MFD is this green line is us this is where we are at in our orbit around the earth and this yellow line points to where the ISS is at in its orbit around the earth now there's a few things that I want to show right now we have a difference in distance between ourselves and the ISS of it's not quite a quarter of an orbit but it's quite a bit it's you know close to a quarter of an orbit it's going to take us several orbits around the earth just to catch up to the ISS now as we start getting into synchronizing our orbit we need to understand that we need to understand how far away we are from the target object before we dive into synchronizing our orbit and let me just kind of show what I mean here what I'll do is I'll just warp time forward at 100 and let me press control F2 again and bring this up because I don't want to go out to a thousand that's a little too fast so let's go to 300 so here we are we're going around the we're going around the earth and right about probably here that's one orbit and we're going around the earth again and when the when the green line gets to about here that's two orbits and you can see we're catching up the the distance between ourselves and the ISS is getting less it's it's decreasing and that's going to be about three orbits right there so it looks to me like we've probably got one or two left uh, probably two so that's uh, the fourth orbit probably one more orbit and then we will be basically caught up to the ISS and somewhere around here yeah we're caught up okay so the difference now between ourselves and the ISS is obviously very you know very minimal it's primarily an altitude distance primarily an altitude difference at this point we're down here at 200 kilometers and the ISS is above us at uh, 368 kilometers now we're not going to rendezvous yet we, we, we can't really because I caught I caught up to the ISS too much but what I also want to show is what will sometimes happen when you get when you take off and get into orbit is that you'll end up in a situation like this let me fast forward time quite a bit just to get ourselves very separated a little bit more you might end up in a situation like this that is you took off from you know your launch site and when you got into orbit it turned out that the ISS was basically on the other side of the planet when that happens or when you're you know very far away even a quarter of an orbit away you want the first thing you're gonna wanna do is actually just let yourself catch up to the ISS before you worry about actually trying to set up your sync orbit MFD and the reason for that is because we have to go around so many times that the uh, sync orbit MFD doesn't actually have enough uh, it can't 
count that far out into the future. The sync orbit MFD can only count out into the future for 18 orbits. So when you're this far away from the ISS, what I, what I think the best thing to do is, is to just let some time pass so that you can catch up to the ISS. We're not using any fuel to do this. It's a very, it's a very efficient way to catch up to the ISS. We're just simply letting the laws of physics do the work for us. So if you're in, a, in any situation where you're really far away from the ISS, the first thing you're going to want to do is just a little bit of time warp. And when you're that far out, you actually can go ahead and go to a thousand. I do not recommend going above a thousand. You will find in a lot of cases that if you hit 10,000, especially if you go to a hundred thousand, you'll just buzz right past the ISS. So just be a little patient. Just use a thousand time warp and just let some time pass. You'll notice I am catching up to the ISS. It's going to take a few orbits, but I will catch up eventually. So just let that happen. And of course, you're going to be wondering, well, how close do I want to get? And we'll cover that here in a second as I get closer. Now I'm down to about, uh, not I'm still a little more than a quarter of an orbit away. That's too much. I want to get, I want to be closer than that before I start worrying about sync orbit, I mean. And we're, we're closing the distance. And somewhere, let's go ahead and go back down to 100, somewhere around here. This is pretty good. Take a look at this to where you've got like a, a good looking V, you know, to where it's not just really big like that, but like, like that, like a V shape. This is a good amount of distance to have between yourself and the ISS when you want to start setting up your sync orbit MFD and start thinking about the actual rendezvous. You want to be about this close. If you're a little bit closer, that's fine. If you're a little bit farther back, that's fine too. The problem is if you get too close to the ISS, then you actually end up passing it before you can set up your maneuvers. So you want to be behind it by some amount, like in this case here, and there actually is a situation where if you're above the ISS, you would actually prefer to be in front of it. But in this case, I'm going to assume that you're starting off below the ISS. In some other example, we'll go the other way. We'll, we'll start out above the ISS. But you want to have, again, just look for something that looks like a V. You know, you don't want it to be too tight because then you're too close to the ISS and you don't want it to be too far out because then you're just a bit too far away. So something that looks like that. Now, what we want to do is we want to choose the right time to rendezvous with the ISS. And this is basically purely for cosmetic sake. It has no impact on the actual rendezvous and docking process. It just makes the visuals look better. And what I'm talking about here is we want to rendezvous, we want to actually arrive at the ISS when we're coming into sunrise. Like right now, the, we're back here, you know, so we're still in the dark side. But the ISS is just coming into sunrise right about now. And we would prefer to dock with the ISS. We want to start our docking maneuver at that time. And it's just, again, it's just purely for cosmetic sake because when you look outside in orbiter, you press F1 to go outside and you're on the dark side of the planet, everything's really dark. I mean, you can see in the video playback that it's just very, it's very dark. You can't really see very well. But when you get around to the day side, so we'll go ahead and warp time forward to get the delta glider into the sunrise. And here we're crossing the day night terminator, so we'll go back to real time. And you can just see a lot better. It's just, it's a prettier view. You can see when you're looking at the ISS out there in front of you, the sun's reflecting off of it, and you can just see things a whole lot better. So the way we, the way we can make sure that we start our docking, or, or well, I should say, the way we can make sure that we rendezvous with the ISS at sunrise is by setting this point as our as our apoapsis point. Now, the way we do that is quite simple. We're going to go around to the day-night terminator over here. Just fast forward time a little bit. And you'll see the delta glider here in just a moment coming into the sunset. 
Now I'm going to go to the prograde position because if I want to adjust my apoapsis, I want to raise it just a little bit. By raising my apoapsis just a little bit, I will actually set my apoapsis to be over here. And you'll see what I'm talking about as we get to this point here in just a moment. I'm still a little bit back, so I want to go forward a little farther before I do this. And again, the prograde autopilot's on, but since I'm only going forward a little bit, it's okay to go ahead and use 10x, even though the prograde autopilot's on. And I just want to wait till my ship crosses that day-night terminator. Or, you know, pretty close. It doesn't have to be exact, but basically right about here. Now, notice that my orbit is basically perfectly circular. That means that every point of my orbit is the same height as every other point. So by just using a little bit of translation here, I don't even have to use the main engines. I can just switch to translation mode. Rotation. That's rotation. That's not what I want. Translation. That's translation. Now I'm facing prograde. So since I'm facing the direction of flight, if I add in a little bit of forward thrust using translation, you notice it's raising my apoapsis. It's 205.4. And my apoapsis is being raised on the opposite side. So you can see the... Um, let me do this. You can see the screen bubble here. That's where my apoapsis is at right now. And I want it to be basically right here. So I'm just going to press 6. And you can see that green bubble here is moving around this direction. And I'm just going to press 6 a few times just to make sure that this point over here on the opposite side is my apoapsis. Just a little bit more. And it doesn't have to be exact. Right Where it's at right now is fine, but that's good enough. So what I've just done is I've established... Let me switch back to the mods. Now notice I did... My orbit's no longer perfectly circular, but that's fine. But what I've done is I've now established this point in space as my apoapsis, my high point. And that happens to be right about here where the day-night uh, terminator meets and we get into sunrise. Now the reason um, I do this, the reason you want to do this, is because we have two points in our orbit that make for very convenient locations for rendezvous. We have our periapsis point, which is here, and we have our apoapsis point, which is here. Any other point of the orbit, because it's, it's trickier to try to rendezvous at some arbitrary point in your orbit because there's no markers that's really the only reason for it is there's no markers anywhere else along the line the only marker that we have is this green bubble here that's filled in and the one that's filled in is our periapsis and we have this green bubble over here that's not filled in and that's our apoapsis and we just need to know where these points are at okay now what i'm going to do is I need now to make sure that my apoapsis is the same altitude as the ISS. But I don't know what the out what I don't know what the altitude of the ISS is at this point. So here's how we figure that out. And this is also why we start doing things when we're a bit far back because we have to go around a few times. The way I can find out what the ISS's altitude is at this point is just by doing a bit of time warp. So we're going to do a, we're going to do quite a bit of time warp. So I'm going to turn off the prograde autopilot. Try to get in the habit of thinking about the autopilots every time you get every time you get ready to do time warp. Remember to turn them off. What I'm going to do then is just press T a couple of times, and I'm watching this yellow dash or this yellow long line here. When it gets over to this point, I'm going to take note of what the altitude is at that exact moment. And let me just show you what I mean when we get to that point. As it gets close, go back to 10 so that you don't overshoot. We're at 10x. And now we're basically right there. So let's go all the way down to 0 0.1. So now we're not even real time. We're, we're less than real time. This, and if it helps, you can turn off the graphics for a, or turn off the information for a moment because sometimes the um, the bubble will be at a point where the information is blocking it. So if you press mod, you can toggle this stuff off. But right now you can see this long yellow line, which is the position of the ISS, is pointing 
to exactly the point of my apoapsis. So I want to know what the altitude of the ISS is right now, and that is 361.3. .3. So I need to write that number down. 361.3. .3. Now I can go back to real time by pressing T. So what I need to do is I need to raise my apoapsis so that my apoapsis at this point is 361.3 kilometers. Now, how do I raise my apoapsis? Well, remember, uh, everything that we do uh, when we're raising and lowering our orbit has to be done on the opposite side of the planet. So I can't raise my apoapsis here. I have to go around to my periapsis in order to raise my apoapsis. So I'm gonna go ahead and warp time forward at 100. That'll be sufficient. And I know when I'm going to be at my periapsis because my PET, time to periapsis, or periapsis time, is given to me here. But I can also just see the long green line as it gets closer to that point. That's how I know. But I want to we'll kind of watch the PET. When the PET gets down to about 100, remember, I want to come back to real time and give the autopilot time to do its work. So we're getting close. Let's go back to real time. Now let's go prograde because I need to raise my apoapsis. And whenever we need to raise our altitude, we need to be facing the direction of flight. We covered this in the previous video, raising and lowering the orbit. Whenever we need to raise our orbit, we need to be facing the direction of flight, and that's prograde. So I'm just giving the autopilot time to settle. Okay, the autopilot settled and we just have a little bit to go so again i'm going to go ahead and leave the prograde autopilot on and it's okay to do this i'll warp time forward by a factor of 10 because we're just going forward a little bit now it's not going to take much engine thrust at all to raise my to raise my altitude so i'm not going to press plus and hold it you know i just want to wait until i get down to maybe five seconds or so and then I'll add in a, a several clicks of main engine by pressing control and then tapping the plus key a few times right about now. And again, I'm going for an apoapsis of 361.3. .3. So I'm watching my APA. It's right here. You can see it counting up, getting ready to kill the engines here and kill the engines. Rotation. And now we'll get the rest of it with translation. And again, we're going for 361.3. .3. So now we're very close. Now I'm going to press control and hold it and hold down the six key just to get the last little bit. Okay, that's done. Now I can go ahead and turn the prograde autopilot off. Now understand what just happened there. I found that the altitude of the ISS at that point was 361.3 .3 kilometers. So I raised that side of my orbit so that my altitude would be 361.3 .3 kilometers at that same point. But we still have an issue of time. Right now, the ISS will pass this point, and I will pass that point, and at that point we were both at the same altitude, but the ISS may be, you know, two or three minutes ahead of me. And, and because things obviously are moving so fast in space, you, if, the, if the ISS is, is ahead of us by more than, you know, a, a few seconds, then it's, we're talking, you know, thousands and thousands of meters, you know, so if it's ahead of me by two or three minutes, then, you know, we, it's, it's just, we, there's no way we'll ever catch up to it. So what we have to do now is we have to synchronize our orbits so that at some point in the future, I will pass this point in space at the exact same moment that the ISS will pass that point, and that's called a rendezvous. We, we're basically crossing a point in space at the same time, and we want our relative velocities to be fairly low so that we don't have a lot of correction to do. So let's learn now how to use Sync Orbit MFD. We will bring up Sync Orbit on this side, and we get to that by, you know, obviously pressing Select and then Sync Orbit. Now, by default, this is what it looks like. There's not a whole lot going on, and it should be fairly obvious that what we need to do is target the ISS because there's nothing else that we can do. 
So we'll press target and this works the same way as every other MFD so I won't go into a lot of detail here. But when you press target, you can't click spacecraft. You have to press target, use the arrow key, go over to ISS that way or simply by name, hit enter and type ISS. Now, what we have to do here, the, the reference for our rendezvous point by default is set to intersect one and this really doesn't mean anything to us. So the way we change our reference is by clicking mod and it goes from intersect one to intersect two. The one that we want is going to be SH Apple Apsis because we chose the Apple Apsis as our rendezvous point. So here SH Apple Apsis means ship, ship is me, that's us. So we're picking this ship's Apple Apsis as a rendezvous point. Notice that this line's pointing to here and that's basically, you know, if you were to over, if you were to superimpose this over top of this, you would notice that this point is pointing to that position right there. Now there are a couple of others. There's target periapsis, which is over here. There's target apoapsis, which is over here. And target, of course, is the ISS. So the other options would be to rendezvous with the target's apoapsis or periapsis, but we're not going to do that. Um, and, and I and I and would I went tripping over my tongue there a bit. I would tell you to not do that either. You always, when you're starting out, always choose probably the ship's apoapsis is probably going to be your safest bet uh, when you're starting out below the ISS and you need to raise your orbit out. If you're going the other direction and you're starting out above the ISS and you're going to come down, then you would probably you may very well want to choose your ship's periapsis. So the next thing that we want to do is these orbit, uh, the number of the number of orbits that sync orbit shows by default is five. It shows our current orbit plus four more. Let's press the LEN button and give it the maximum number which is 18. So it gives us our current orbit plus an additional plus an additional 17. Let me take a quick, quick sip of water. I found uh, sync orbit to be pretty confusing when I was brand new to Orbiter, so I'll try to spend a little bit of time here trying to maybe explain some things that would have benefited me back in the day. This column over here, uh, well, first of all, this orbit column, OB orbit, this is the orbit that we're currently on in this one that's basically one orbit in the future so if we were to sit here and go all the way around that would be one orbit two orbits would obviously be two orbits and so on <clears throat> this sh uh, hyphen tor i don't actually know what the tor stands for <clears throat> i'm not sure if it's mentioned in the pdf or not if you bring up uh, the orbit orbiter.pdf from your doc directory go to page 97 and you can read about synchronizing the orbits. Um, yeah, I don't see where it tells you what the TOR means. But anyway, the ship to TOR basically is the amount of time that it's going to take us to reach the rendezvous point. So maybe it's a ship to rendezvous or something like that. We are currently, we're here, we are currently 2,325 seconds away from the rendezvous point. The ISS is ahead of us, obviously. That's the target. The ISS is currently 2,050 seconds away from the rendezvous point. And if we take into account one full orbit, then we are 7,705 seconds away from the rendezvous point if we go around, you know, not just here but go all the way around and what this yellow line is showing us here this is what this is what sync orbit mfd thinks is the best time to rendezvous with the iss based on uh, proximity we will be closest to the iss on our third orbit however we will not be close enough to actually rendezvous. You can see there's still a significant difference here in time. We will reach the rendezvous point 
in 18,040, uh, 18,460 seconds, whereas the target, the ISS, will reach that point in 18,490 seconds. That's the difference of several minutes, and that difference of several minutes equates to several thousand, well, at least several dozen kilometers, if not hundreds of kilometers. So what we actually have to do is we have to bring these times so that they're exactly the same, because we want to arrive at this point three orbits from now so that these numbers match exactly. And orbit, uh, sync orbit MFD tells us the difference, and that's here, DT min, and I actually do not know what that stands for. Um, difference in time, something like that, but there's currently a difference in time of 31.85, and I'm guessing that's seconds. So we have, so when we get to this point, <clears throat> we're gonna have a difference of 31.85 seconds between us and the ISS. And again, when you consider how fast things are moving, uh, 31 seconds is just, it's huge. You will, ne you will never be able to rendezvous if you're that far off. So the way we need, the way we can adjust our difference in time, the way we bring it down is we need to basically change the shape of our orbit ever so slightly. But we have to be very careful in changing the shape of our orbit because we don't want to disturb this point. This point in space here is where we're going to rendezvous, and we know that the ISS is going to be at 361.3 kilometers at that point, and we need to make sure that we don't disturb this point. So since every action that we apply occurs on the opposite side of the planet, what we can do is we can actually come to this point and do a small amount of burning so that it will adjust this side because we don't really care about this side of our orbit. We're not rendezvousing with the ISS over here, so we don't care what our orbit looks like over here. We just need to make sure that this doesn't change. Okay, so let's warp time forward to this point and we're coming to our apoapsis so we can watch our APT. going forward at 100 just to be nice and safe. And when our APT gets down to about 100, we'll come back to real time, and then we'll turn on prograde. Actually, before we get to that point, let me uh, stop at about 500 seconds. And we, we can figure out ahead of time if we need to add, uh, if we need to add velocity or if we need to remove velocity. Okay, we are arriving at the rendezvous point ahead of schedule basically so we need to raise the other side of our orbit a little bit okay so we're gonna do a bit of prograde maneuvering at this point so let's go ahead and warp time forward get closer to the APT And we're almost there, so let's go back to real time and let's go prograde. And when you do this particular maneuver, you can actually always be in the prograde position. You don't have to it, you don't have to be retrograde. What you can do if you need to reduce a little bit of velocity, you can be in the prograde position and then use backwards translation, which will actually which would be the same thing as using which would be the same thing if you were if you were retrograde and using forward translation. But that might be a little confusing, so I won't go into any more detail on that. We're 151 seconds away from apoapsis. Let's go ahead and warp time forward again to get closer to that point. And what I'm going to do when I get to that point is I just want to use a little bit of forward translation to bring the DT min down. And this will, you'll see that this will come down very quickly. So let me just uh, go ahead and warp time forward here, 10x. And I'll get this all the way down to just maybe two seconds. Okay, we're almost there, so back to real time so we don't overshoot. Make sure translation's on. Translation. Okay, we're at translation, and we're basically there. So now, with just a little bit of six, press and hold six, you can see that DT min over here coming down. And I'm doing this just with translation. I'm not using the main engines. Okay, we're almost there. And when you get really low, down to one second and less, switch over to control six because this is very very sensitive 
and there we have it. We have a dt min of zero. Now you'll see what's happened is that our th this number here, our timing for this third orbit, which you know we this is our current orbit, second orbit, third orbit. These numbers now match exactly. So we will be at this point in 16,190 seconds, and the ISS will be at that point in 16,180 seconds. We'll see they match exactly. Now, I want to talk again one last time about permutations. As we circle the globe, the DT min may slip slightly, especially if you have to go around 10, 11, 12 orbits. What I do is basically just go ahead and circle the globe several times, but when you're down to your last orbit, you just want to make sure, again, that your DT min is 0.00, .00 or very close to it. If it's off by 0 0.01 or something, you'll probably be okay, but you really want it to be as close to 0.00, .00 as possible. Now is a good time to set up our radio frequencies. We have three orbits to go before we'll catch up to the ISS. So rather than wait until we're right on top of the ISS to set up our communications, we'll go ahead and do that now. This will introduce a new MFD that we haven't covered yet. A couple of new MFDs, in fact, but, the, the, but they're very simple. On this side, we don't really need orbit MFD at this point for anything. So we'll go ahead and bring up ComNav on this side. So just select ComNav. Now the way we navigate this is very simple. This SL Plus makes this the active uh, frequency, or, or I should say it makes this the active uh, line so that we can adjust the frequency for this line. If I press SL Plus again, it goes to this one. SL Plus again, it goes to that one and then minus obviously goes backwards. So plus to go down, minus to go up, very simple. What we need to do is we need to set our nav one to the, and it doesn't matter which one you use, but it just logically we'll use nav one. We need to set nav one to the transponder of the ISS. And the way we can get the transponder information inside of Orbiter without having to exit out and read documentation is by pressing control I. Control I will bring up the object info dialog box here. And we want to click this drop down box to go from camera target to vessel, because we're going to be picking a vessel. And in this drop down over here, we want to choose the ISS. Now, this XPDR, that's short for transponder, the transponder frequency of the ISS is 131.30. The way we adjust that here is by using these, uh, these four arrows. The big arrow adjusts the big number, and the little, the double arrows adjust the little number. And we need to go forward because we're at 112.70, so we need a bigger number. We need to go forward. So 112, actually I guess it's the other way around. The two arrows adjust the bigger number. Uh, so we need to adjust the bigger number all the way out to 131. And we need the smaller number to be 30, so we need to go backwards on that one. And there we have it. We have our nav 1 is set to 131.30. That's the same frequency as the transponder for the ISS. What we also want to do is we want to set one of the other frequencies for one of the docking collars of the ISS. And we'll do that here. You can see there's five. So we can pick any other one, but it just makes sense to use number two. And we can pick number one, two, three. I actually like number three the best. Um, there's a reason for it, which I won't get into now. Someday later, I'll talk about it. Basically, it has to do with the orientation of the docking collar. If you pick number one, it appears as though you're docking upside down, and I just don't like that. So pick number three. And we need to go, uh, the docking collar number three is 137.20. So we need this number to be bigger, so we'll go forward to 137 and this is already set to 20 so we're good so we've got the transponder and we've got a docking collar picked so we'll go ahead and close that out now we don't do anything else with this uh, comnav 
MFD, that's, that's all you use it for. You just use it to set frequencies. So now we'll click select and we want to bring up the docking MFD. And right now we're too far away from the ISS to get any information from it. But you can see that NAV1 is set to 13130, which was the which was the correct transponder of the ISS. If you click NAV, you go to NAV2, NAV3, NAV4, and we didn't set NAV3 and NAV4 to anything, so these are just arbitrary settings. So we want to have this set for NAV1 as we go around and get ready to approach the ISS. Okay. Now there's nothing left for us to do except warp time 4 because we're 15,860 seconds away. So we're just going to warp time 4 to get closer to the ISS, you know, catch up to it. We'll go ahead and do that at 100. We maybe, yeah, we'll just just do 100 again, be patient. Actually, a 1,000 is still safe, but just don't get carried away with it. And notice here that my DT min, you'll see that it slipped to 0 0.01 for a second, and then it went back to 0, 0.00. Again, that's just the permutations, and sometimes they drift in and out, and that's okay as long as it just doesn't go way out. If you're going around, you know, 15, 16, 17 orbits, you may find that your DT min slips by a, sub a substantial amount. Now we're 9,000 seconds away from uh, rendezvous. So let's go ahead and warp time forward a little bit farther. And now we have, I'll go ahead and pause, we're still a ways out, but we, we're we close enough to the ISS now that this MFD just came online. It looks like it came online at around 900 kilometers. So we're, we're currently 867 kilometers from the ISS. That may actually go up and down until we are on our final orbit. Uh, here the DT min is now 0 0.01, that's okay. But if it still says 0 0.01 by the time I get over here, I'll go ahead and do a small adjustment. So right now I'm just watching these lines come together. We're still one full orbit away. We have to go all the way around a whole nother time before rendezvous. And it looks like that DT min is going to be stubborn. It's going to stick at 0 0.01. Again, that's just a little bit of permutation there. So we'll go back to real time. Now that we're approaching the rendezvous point, and I'll bring up Orbit MFD temporarily. I'm 130 seconds away from that, you know, from Apoapsis. So let me go prograde. And this is only going to require me to press Control 6 or Control 9. And since these numbers are so close together, I don't know which way I need to go. So I'm going to press Control 6 first once I get closer to the APT. And just, just to be, just to clarify, you don't need to adjust it when it's 0.01. It's this is good enough, but we'll make the adjustment anyway. So when we're down to about one second, about right there. Okay, now I don't know if I need to go forward or backwards. So I'm just going to press Control Six, and that took care of it. If if I went, say say Control Six didn't help and it maybe it made it worse like that, then I would just press Control Nine. And that just it's just a little bit of engine thrust. It just changes my velocity by a tiny, tiny amount. But that tiny, tiny amount just helps make sure that I will rendezvous with the ISS at the same time. You see, we're now uh, 5,388 seconds away from rendezvous, basically one orbit away. So turn uh, prograde autopilot off. Now go ahead and warp time forward at 100. And again, we don't need Orbit MFD anymore, so let's close that out and bring up Docking MFD. It's more useful. And we can see our distance indicator. Now, don't worry, the DT min just slipped there a little bit. Don't worry about it. Um, don't, you, don't, you do not want to warp time forward all the way to the rendezvous point before you start making decisions. Come to where you are close, but not quite all the way there. And I'll show you what I mean. We're still half an orbit away, so we can still warp time forward quite a bit. But what we really want to start watching now is the distance here. In fact, we can kind of come back to real time for a moment. And we're basically done with sync orbit at this point. It's done its job. It has allowed me to synchronize my orbit so that I'm going to rendezvous with the ISS over at this point. I don't really need this MFD up anymore. I'm really only going to start looking at this side. But I'll go ahead and leave this 
up anyway, just so you can see it. What we do kind of want to do now at this point also is switch our HUD from orbit over to dock. This gives us more useful information than orbit. Orbit doesn't give us any details about the ISS. But if we switch over to the dock in, uh, HUD, rotation. we actually, and I'm just doing rotation at this point, I'm not changing velocity, we can see where the ISS is at. We won't actually be able to see the ISS, it's too far away, but we can see where it's at. The ISS is right there, it's inside this box. We're too far away to see it, but it's inside this box. So if I kind of rotate the vessel, you know, like that, I should basically be pointing straight at the ISS right now. But let me explain to the best of my ability what some of these icons mean. So we know where the ISS is at. The ISS is inside this box. But what does this mean? What does what does this bullseye mean? It's, it's the velocity vector. This is the velocity vector of the ISS, and there's actually two of them. Uh, just like with our own. If we go backwards, if we turn the ship the other way, we have the positive velocity vector that we were just looking at. And on the opposite side, we have the negative velocity vector. As we're approaching the ISS, we're going to need to eliminate whatever difference we have in velocity. Think about driving down the highway, and you're in a car, and you're doing, um, you know, 45 miles an hour or whatever, and there's another car that wants to rendezvous with you. They want to pull up beside you and have a conversation, which would be a terrible idea, but let's just bear with me. So they're driving down the road, and they're trying to catch up to you, and they're going 100 miles an hour. What they have to do in order to, you know, rendezvous, in order to get up next to you, when, once they pull up beside you, they, they're they going to have to slow down to meet your velocity or else they're just going to pass right by. That's basically what we're going to have to do when we catch up to the ISS. There's a difference in our velocities. We're going to be traveling faster than the ISS. So once we pull up beside the ISS, we, we need to slow down. So these indicators for the ISS, the negative velocity vector and the positive velocity vector are basically telling us which way we need to orient the vessel in order to change velocity. Currently, our difference in velocity is 166 meters per second. That's quite a bit, but it's, it's going down as we get closer. When we arrive near the ISS, we're going to want to basic, we're, there's two possibilities. We want to point at the negative velocity vector and use the main engines. The other possibility is to point our vessel at the positive velocity vector and then use reverse engines. Either way, we're accomplishing the same thing. Either way, we're slowing down. But it's just two ways of doing the same thing. In fact, what I'm going to do I'm going to press Control S right now. I'm going to save this scenario because the actual catching up and rendezvous process, we're going to do it in two or three different ways just to show you some different examples. A good idea when you're getting ready to rendezvous is to open your retro doors. That's done by coming over here. You know, click the retro and if you look outside, you'll see the retro doors opening. That will allow you to, you know, use either engine. You can use the main engine or you can use the retro engine. What we're going to do is we're going to we're going to use the retro engines. So we're going to face the positive velocity vector. That's the one that looks like a plus sign, and we're going to use the 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 uh, retro engines to slow ourselves down. Okay, try to try to understand what I'm saying here is that. If we're facing forward and we use the retro engines, we're slowing ourselves down. It's the same thing as if we were facing backwards and using the main engines to slow down. Either way, we're slowing down. The important, that's the important thing to understand is that we're slowing down. Now, the timing on this 
takes a little bit of experience, but basically we're still 94 kilometers away from the ISS. That's quite a bit. So we can we can still warp time forward a bit more. And you can see we know we're obviously a quarter of an orbit away from the rendezvous point. We don't want to get too close because we do have to take into account the fact that we need to slow ourselves down. But we we can get closer than, you know, 90 kilometers, 70 kilometers. So right now I'm just being patient, warping time forward at 10 10 x acceleration. And based on the relative velocity difference, uh, you know, I know that we can get within a, you know, a couple dozen kilometers or so. There's a, w there's a way to calculate that, by the way, if you don't know when to start slowing down. Uh, you can look into some calculators. Let's go forward a little farther. We're still 45 kilometers out, and it's just not going to take that much time to eliminate this velocity. And again, as we get closer to the ISS, since we're climbing uphill at this point, we're slowing down ourselves. But, you know, the ISS is right there. It's inside that box. We can't really see it yet. Uh, one other thing I'll briefly point out on this side, if we come up to map MFD, uh, you can see, you know, we're still here in the dark. But as we get actually over to the rendezvous point, we should just be coming into sunrise. And we don't really need sync orbit M MFD anymore, so I'm going to go ahead and just leave map MFD up on this side. So we're approaching the ISS. We're 30 kilometers out. using a little bit of 10x, just uh, being careful, just not to be, as you're doing the rendezvous, just be very careful with your time warp. We're 23 kilometers out. Let me go back to real time for a moment and just straighten the vessel out. Okay, again, the ISS is inside of this box, but we're still too far away to see it. You can't really see the ISS until you're really close to it, just a kilometer or so. We might be able to see some lights flashing or some flickering here pretty soon. 15 kilometers out. Now our relative velocity is starting to increase. We're just down to 10 kilometers. Let's go back to real time. And we can actually see the shape of the ISS just barely. If you're not sure when to start your, your, your slowing down process, what you can do is point your vessel to the positive velocity vector and just do a test burn. See we're nine kilometers out, so let's bring our let's bring our relative velocity down to 30. So I'm gonna use the minus key so I can uh, use the retro engines. And I'm just slowing my vessel down a little bit. And I can see now I'm at 30 meters per second roughly and I'm nine kilometers out. So, I mean, just, just logically, I can tell that I can get in closer than that. So let's go forward a little bit farther at 10x. Let's go down to 5 kilometers. Then we'll really be able to see the ISS pretty well at that point. Let's go back to real time. So let's say that now, you, you again, you don't know if you should do all of your braking. Well, what you can do, again, rotate your vessel to the positive velocity vector so that it's right smack dab on the center and just slow down a little bit more. Now we're eliminating another uh, 10 meters a second. Now we're down to 20 meters per second and the ISS is only 5 kilometers out. It's right there. And I want to basically be within a kilometer of the ISS before I before I get my relative velocity to zero. So I'm comfortable with going ahead and warping time forward a little bit more, but just be careful, don't go to 100, that's too much. And we're getting pretty close. Let's go, let's go about right there, two and a half kilometers. Let's go ahead and zero out the velocity difference. So I'll point the vessel right at the positive velocity vector, and I'm going to use the retro engines to bring the CVEL, the, 
you know, the relative velocity difference down to zero. About right there. Now I am uh, two kilometers away from the ISS and I'm not getting any closer to it or farther away from it. What you do at this point is you switch over to translation thrusters and now we want to bring the velocity vector over to the ISS. Rotation. Translation. Rotation. Just give me one second here. So we need to find the velocity vector first of all. There it is. Translation. And I just translate it down like that using just translation thrusters. Rotation. And I'm just moving that velocity vector. Translation. Over top of the ISS. Rotation. Translation. Rotation. Translation. Like that. Now, I want to rotate the vessel so I'm pointing at the ISS. Okay, right now I'm two kilometers away from the ISS and I'm closing in at just 2.42 meters per second. That's a pretty good, that's a pretty good number for this distance. Now what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to save this scenario here and we'll, I'll pick up this scenario for docking at some point in the future. Let me close out the HUD by pressing Control H and I'll, I'll bring it back up every now and then but for now I'm going to close it so we can see the ISS better and I'm just going to warp time forward at a factor of 10 so we can see what happens here just in the last few seconds. You can see I'm closing in, the ISS is 1.6 kilometers out and I'm still closing in at just 2 0.8 meters per second. That's that's nothing. We can control this last little bit of velocity just with translation thrusters. So we don't need retro engines or main engines or anything. And that's really what you want to have. You want to show up at the ISS when you have just a difference of a couple of meters per second. That way all your maneuvers are very small. Now we're just at 900 meters out. 800 meters out, 700 and when we get down to about 500, I'll go back to real time. And there we are back to real time. And by the way, we crossed over the day-night terminator. So we'll be able to do our docking during the day, which is what we wanted to do. Go ahead and power this side off now because we don't need it. And we can see the ISS. Go ahead and press Control H to bring the HUD back up. Now, if you find yourself in this situation where you're kind of closing in on the ISS and you're maybe panicking a little bit, because you you just don't know how to stop it or you don't know how to prevent yourself from moving what you want to do Translation. is just translate the velocity vector over top of the ISS you can put it right inside that box in fact and then just use rotation uh, and then rotate your vessel so that it's pointing at the velocity vector Translation. and then translate the difference here to get rid of that last little bit of velocity See, I'm just using 9 reverse translation just to eliminate that velocity. That will give me more time to think, basically, because I'm only 325 meters at this point out from the ISS. So again, just eliminating some velocity there. Okay, so here I am, I'm right by the ISS, 320 kilometers away from it, or excuse me, 320 meters away from it, and my difference in velocity is almost nothing. So docking at this point will be very, very simple. Um, I'm going to have to go ahead and end it here for this part of the video because it's, it's coming up on an hour already, and I just don't want to make these too, too long. But I am definitely going to come back and cover this topic in at least one more video, possibly two, because rendezvousing in synchronizing the orbit it's just it's a little tricky it's it takes some it takes a few tries it takes several examples to really understand how it works but the thing I just the point that I just want to leave at here is that we're this is our situation notice that I'm basically parked right by the ISS 
if I warp time forward, I will drift away from the ISS. So I will, I do require some occasional translations to keep myself here in position. You know, it's just maintenance, basically. That CVEL is kind of what I'm looking at. It needs to basically be 0, 0.00 in order for me to stay here by the ISS. So if I, you know, if I were to try to warp time forward at a thousand right now, I would eventually drift pretty far away from the ISS. But it, but for now, I'm I'm basically parked here. I've got lots of time to sit here right by the ISS. My difference in velocity is basically zero, and I can now uh, come over and dock quite easily. Okay, well, I hope you enjoyed this part of the video, and uh, if you like the series, please uh, click the like button down below. And if you like my uh, if you like my style, go ahead and subscribe to my channel so that you can see all my new videos. And check my description down below for a link to my Facebook page. I have an Orbiter Facebook page where I post all my videos, and occasionally I'll post some various pictures and other things that you don't see here on my YouTube channel. So go ahead and uh, subscribe to my uh, Facebook uh, page as well. And I will see you in the next video. And how to lower our or how to lower our orbit. And that's a important concept that uh, we absolutely have to understand if we're ever going to get much of it anywhere in space. And we also talked about sort of the dangers of orbital decay. You know, what, what can happen if you're not paying attention and you accidentally lower your orbit on one side a bit too far. You get down into, uh, you know, once you get down much below 150 kilometers, you start experiencing a lot of orbital decay and so we just want to make sure that we're constantly aware of our situation so that we don't have any of those types of problems. Now finally uh, we are getting probably to what is going to be the exciting part for a lot of new orbinauts. We're going to talk about the actual rendezvous process. This is where we will catch up to the International Space Station. Now, I'm not actually going to cover docking in this video. Docking is actually pretty simple, uh, but we'll save that for a separate video. The rendezvous process is probably going to be the more difficult step th that you'll encounter. When you're, when you're starting out, you're going to find that getting up into orbit and getting a stable, you know, 200 kilometer orbit, that meaning that you're apoapsis and your periapsis are both about 200 kilometers. That's a stable low Earth orbit. You'll find that you'll be able to do that pretty easily. And I think you'll also find that aligning the plane is a pretty simple process once you understand, you know, the descending node and the ascending node. But the actual rendezvous process is a little tricky. And it requires uh, us to look at another MFD, which is called sync orbit MFD. But I'll do my best to go through this slowly so that you can follow along and I'm also going to do at least two different rendezvous maybe even three or four because this is this this rendezvous process is tricky enough that I don't feel like just showing one example is good enough I think you need to see it at least two or three times but let's go ahead and jump into it now very advanced but it's an advanced concept and when you're new to Orbiter, you, you don't really want to have that turned on. It will make things way confusing for you. And you really, you know, think of it in terms of uh, if you're wanting to learn to drive a car, you don't want to start out by getting on the Indy 500 raceway with a bunch of other drivers. You want to start off in your mom and dad's, you know, four-cylinder uh car and drive around the neighborhood you know you want to start simple so turn off the non-spherical gravity sources if you have that enabled okay now let's bring up orbit mfd on this side and as usual we'll do what we usually do which is to change the projection to ship and we'll change the distance readout so that we have our distance showing above the surface as we go forward in these in the future videos, I'm going to do this kind of thing automatically, and I'm not going to explain it every single time, because by now, hopefully, you've, you know, you've seen the previous videos and you know why I'm making these changes. 
as we discussed, we've already aligned the plane, so we're basically we're basically done with aligned plane MFD. As we go around the Earth, we can experience something called permutations in our orbit, and sometimes those permutations can knock our relative inclination out just a little bit. You know, for it may go from point zero zero to say point zero one or something like that. So every now and then as we're circling the globe, we may want to bring back up a line plane MFD just to make sure that our orbit hasn't been perturbed by some amount. And on the topic of permutations, I want to mention that in the orbiter launch pad, when you go into the parameters, there are some different options for realism. One of the options that I highly recommend that you turn off when you're new is the non-spherical gravity sources. I think it's okay to leave the uh, uh, gradient torque, I think that's what it's called. I think it's okay to leave that one turned on, but the non-spherical gravity sources will, it's, it's a very advanced, well, I shouldn't say. Okay, welcome to another Orbiter 2010 video. And this is another video in my series that I'm putting together that I'm basically calling the Absolute Beginner Guide. And this video series has an emphasis on people that are brand new to Orbiter. Uh, you've downloaded the program, you've got it installed, but you're still struggling to just do uh, very basic tasks with Orbiter. So I am assuming that you are watching these videos in order. Uh, I believe we're up to number five or six now. I've actually kind of started to lose count myself. But I'm assuming that uh, you've watched you know, part one and that you know how to get your vessel into uh, a stable orbit and in part three and four we kind of talked about how to align planes so you know these videos were, were they're stepping stones each one is each one is building on concepts that we covered in previous videos so if you're finding this video um, as your first one then you're gonna gonna you're going to want to go back and start at part one and watch them in order okay in the last video we covered how to uh, raise our orbit 